Pastor Eugene. I'm sure some of you are honestly disappointed because you probably thought, <laughs> my dad will be preaching. He's over there at Suntech though. Um, he's just being there with the rest of us there. Um, well, I'm just going to jump straight into the message because it's a little bit of a longer message. We're all going to be here until 1 p.m. this uh, afternoon. Uh, because today's message covers actually two chapters of the book of Acts. But before we do that, I just want to quickly do a quick recap of what we've been going through so far through the book of Acts. As you know, the book of Acts is part of our sermon series called To the Ends of the Earth. And at this point of time in the book of Acts, once we move to the later half, the later parts of the book of Acts rather, uh, we start to see how the Apostle Paul himself, he is making his way to the ends of the earth and he is speaking, he's sharing the message of Jesus Christ to all the various towns and all the regions. And that's why we have this segment called Beyond Borders because it's about his, uh, his missionary journeys. And last week, Pastor Tai Tong, he brought to us a message from Acts chapter 17. I thought it was a great message. Uh, it was called Cultural Revolution. Uh, uh, sorry, Cultural Revelation. And that was where Paul, he shared among the Greek philosophers and he, he was preaching to the people in Athens. And today we're here in Acts chapter 18 and 19. And uh, it's a very long, it's two very long segments, but I'm just going to do a brief explanation of what happens in these two chapters first, all right? We're not going to look at any scripture uh, until later on because through the message we'll be looking at it. But I've broken down these two chapters basically into 10 parts, 10 smaller parts. I'm just going to explain to you what happens in these parts because uh, yesterday I did it and it got very confusing with all the different scripture we're jumping to and fro. Uh, but let me just explain it to all of us. The first thing that happens in Acts chapter 18 is, number one, we read about Paul and how he ministers at Corinth. So basically, at the start of Acts chapter 18, all right, go back and do read it on your own as well, we see how Paul, he goes to the city of Corinth, he meets a couple named, of, a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, and then he starts ministering there. He goes to the synagogue there, and he starts teaching them, but he starts getting rejected by the people of the synagogue. Right? He's rejected, and he leaves the synagogue. And instead of teaching, instead of remaining and teaching at the synagogue, he gets all the believers and they go to the house next to the synagogue and he starts teaching in that house instead. Okay, and many people started believing. Now the next part in Acts chapter 18 is a part where God speaks to Paul. Now this is a very important part where God speaks to Paul. Now what does God speak to Paul about? He says something crucial here. I'm not to look at this scripture though. It's in Acts chapter 18 verses 9 to 11. It says this, The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silence, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Why did God say this to him? God had to say this to Paul, because if you know, Paul often faced a lot of opposition. And here in Acts chapter 18 and 19, he was facing opposition, which brings us to the third part. We read about how Paul faces opposition. And if you look at the, uh, the next few verses of Acts chapter 18, you read about how the Jews rise up against Paul. They bring him to the governor or to the proconsul, and they want Paul to be charged in the court of law for doing something illegal in the Roman Empire. And so they wanted to charge him with that, but in the end, nothing happened. All right? In the end, he was spared. Uh, the, the governor refused to hear the case. And what does Paul do then? Well, the fourth part is this. Paul, he returns back to Antioch and he continues to minister. Next part, you read about how Aquila and Priscilla will meet this uh, man by the name of Apollos. He's a disciple and he's a very anointed preacher. And then we come to Acts chapter 19. What happens at the start of Acts chapter 19? Acts chapter 19 is the start of Paul's third missionary journey. Okay, and he goes into into the place and he starts baptizing people in the Holy Spirit and what happens there? As usual, he faces opposition again. Paul faces a lot of uh, uh, opposition. People refuse to listen to him and they oppose him and as a result, he cannot longer remain in the synagogues to teach and so he, he goes elsewhere to teach people. And then it comes to this very interesting part in Acts chapter 19. And later we'll be talking about all these different parts. The very interesting part is about, we read about how a group of exorcists are defeated. There's a group of Jewish exorcists 
who, who have been seeing and watching Paul minister. They've been hearing how Paul has preached. They've been hearing what Paul says. And so when they encounter some demon, they encounter one specific demon, they try to do the same thing. What do they do? They say, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out. But what happens? The demon in the end ends up defeating these exorcists. And it's a very interesting story we'll talk about later. And I think it's a very pertinent part of Acts chapter 19. And finally, Acts chapter 19 ends off showing us how severe the opposition that Paul was facing was. You read about a riot that happens in Ephesus. There's a riot in Ephesus because of Paul's ministry. Because he was preaching, they were not happy with what he was doing, and there was a riot. And this riot really happened so bad where they seized a number of Paul's companions, and they brought them in front of a mob. And if the, if the riot was not dismissed, the mob would have probably destroyed, would have probably killed all of them, Okay. But finally, the riot is dismissed because a city councilman, a city clerk comes up to them and says, you know, this is illegal and we must not be doing something like that. And then that brings us to Acts chapter 20. And so as you can see, in these two chapters, a lot of things are happening. Don't worry, we're going to be going through these different portions. But it's a very exciting two chapters as we look through the book of Acts. But before we go and look at it in detail, why don't we come and commit this time into the Lord's hands. Lord, we want to just thank you for this time. We ask that your presence will be here. Holy Spirit, come and speak to each and every one of us, both here at Touch Centre and over there at Suntec. Let us just be convicted by your word today so that we will leave this place becoming more and more like you. So we thank you for this time. We commit this time into your hands. In your most mighty name we pray. Amen. And so, as I explain to us what happens in Acts chapter 18 and 19, one thing is for certain. Paul, we can see how Paul has a voice and he's constantly using his voice to serve the Lord as he travels across the different cities. And that's why just now I, I read to us a very pertinent piece of scripture in today's uh, message. That scripture was how the Lord told Paul not to be silent, not to be afraid, but to keep speaking because he is with Paul. And that's why today's sermon is entitled, Beyond Borders Won't Stay silent. You see, today what I want to tell all of us is this, that if we want to serve God, then we must not remain silent. We must have this attitude that we say, I won't stay silent. You know, there's this man by the name of Robert Layton. He was a Scottish church minister in the 1600s. He later became an archbishop and he made this very profound statement. Robert Layton says this, a holy life is a voice. It speaks when the tongue is silent and it's either a constant attraction or a perpetual reproof, reproof or rejection. It says, he says, a holy life is a voice that speaks even when the tongue is silent. You know, as I read this statement here, I'm reminded of a couple of phrases that we use commonly in the English language. We like to say this, you know, we'll say that something speaks volumes. We say that, right? Something speaks volumes. Or we say something says a lot. But you know what? When we use these two phrases, we're not actually talking about literal speech. Why? Because we'll say, your actions speak volume. Our actions don't actually speak. Our actions don't have a mouth. There's no verbal communication there. But yet we say, our actions speak volume. We say, our actions say a lot about what we believe. And today, there's the same thing here. Paul's attitude was basically this. He would not stay silent. As long as his lungs were breathing, as long as his heart was still uh, beating, he would scream at the top of his voice to all the world that he is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he demonstrated it not just by his own voice, but by the way he lived his life. Because just like what Robert Layton says, your life is a voice. Paul's voice spoke volumes of what he believed in. Paul's life says a lot about what he actually believes in. And so today, all of us here, we must ask ourselves this, you know. What is our, what is our life saying about our beliefs? What, if our, if our life is a voice, what is this voice saying? Are we, are we declaring at the top of our lungs that Jesus Christ is Lord? Or are we declaring some other message? Or in fact, for some of us here, are we completely silent? I believe this is something that the Lord wants us to grapple with this weekend as we look through Acts chapter 18 and 19. The thing is this, are we going to be silent or will we not stay silent? The truth is this, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we should not and we must not be silent. You know, Charles Spurgeon says this, he writes, 
Doth not all nature around me praise God? If I was silent, I should be an exception to the universe. Doth not thunder praise Him as it rolls like drums in the march of the God of armies? Do not the mountains praise Him with the, when the woods upon their summits wave in adoration? Doth not the lightning write His name in letters of fire? Hath not the whole earth a voice? And shall I, can I, silent be? I love this. I love what Spurgeon writes here. It's something so beautiful that if all creation is not silent, if all creation can praise God, if all creation can declare that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, then how can we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, say that we're okay with being silent? We see we're not called to be silent. But of course, we need to understand this, you know. At the same time, as I say this today, that we won't stay silent, that we must not be silent, I'm not here to say that we're just supposed to live a noisy life. In fact, the Bible tells us that we're not supposed to be like a clanging cymbal or a resounding gong that just makes a lot of noise. There are times to be silent and there are times for us to speak volumes. But the ultimate bottom line is this, we must make sure that we do speak with our lives. You know, think of it as this, think of our Christian walk or think of us as Christians, we're just like a singer. What makes a singer a singer? A singer sings, right? I think it's, it's quite straightforward. A singer sings. A singer uses his or her voice. But think about this. Does a singer sing nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No. Even in a song, when a singer is singing a song, there are moments that you pause. There are moments of silence and there are moments of singing. But the bottom line is this. If a singer never ever uses his or her voice, does that, does that qualify that person to be a singer? No, because he or she is not singing. Similarly for us as Christians, where I'm not asking us to make noise all the time. I'm not asking us to live noisy life. There are times to be silent. There are times to be quiet. There are times to speak up. But the thing is this, if we forever remain silent, if our lives never ever say anything that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you know what? We don't qualify to be called disciples of Jesus Christ. Our lives need to scream at the top of its lungs that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whatever we do, the way we live, it must speak volumes that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so today, if we are saying that our lives are voices, well, what should this voice be used for then? I want to share with us two things that we need to use our voices for, two things that we need to be doing in our lives. What are these two things? Number one, our voice, our life must be used for reaching out. It must be used for reaching out. And how do we reach out? We reach out to the people around us through preaching and persuasion. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul does in Acts chapter 18 and 19. He wouldn't stay silent and wherever possible, he will use his life to reach out by preaching and persuading the people around him that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is what happens in the start of Acts chapter 18 in the city of Corinth. Let's look at what it says there. Acts chapter 18 verses 4 to 5. Every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Over here, you read about how Paul was committed to both preaching and persuading the people around him that Jesus was the Messiah or Jesus is the Messiah. But let's hang on for a moment. I know as I say this, before I go any further, some of you might be wondering, is this right? Are we called to reach out through preaching and persuasion? Was it not the Apostle Paul who said something about how we preach not through uh, persuasion? We don't persuade people. I think what we're talking about is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. What the Apostle Paul actually writes is this, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So how does this square up? Here he talks about how, how Paul says, I don't preach with persuasive words, but yet in Acts chapter 18 and 19, it says over and over again about how Paul is persuading people to believe in the Lord. 
Now, I want to say this. Just because he says that he does not rely on persuasive words does not mean he does not persuade people. Relying on persuasive words and persuading people are two completely different things. Let me explain. What does it mean to rely on persuasive words? It means that if he preaches based on a reliance of persuasive words, he's just depending on how good he can speak, on how well he can preach, on how sophisticated he can sound, on how well he can utilize maybe theatrics to bring across a message. But that's not how that preaching is done. In fact, in the New Living Translation, is, this, is what Paul, uh, this is the translation of what Paul says there. He says, My message and my preaching were very plain, or they were very simple. Rather than trying to use clever techniques, using clever uh, ideas and persuasive speeches, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, what he's saying here is that I don't rely on the words that I'm speaking. I rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about there. But what about... So that covers the word, the, the, this whole idea about using persuasive words. But what about this whole idea of persuasion itself? As I said, in the book of Acts, Paul spends a lot of time persuading people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, persuading people is a significant way of reaching out to people as well. For example, I'm up here on the pulpit. I'm preaching to all of you, whether you're here or over there at Suntec. Well, I'm preaching to every single one of you right now. And as I'm preaching here, what am I doing? My preaching, how well my, how successful this sermon is, is not based on how clever I can phrase it or how well I can deliver the message. Is it important how I deliver the message? Of course, it's very important. But ultimately, the way I deliver the message is not going to change lives. The way I deliver the message is not going to transform your life. It is the Holy Spirit. It is God who is here speaking to us and convicting us. That is what will change people's lives. But yet, I must structure my sermon in such a way that I'm able to persuade you to give your life wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ. What does persuasion mean? Persuasion means to reason, to explain, to expound, to help you understand, to convince you. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm convincing us. When we share a sermon, we go, we don't just spout Bible verses nonstop, right? We don't just sing non-stop. No, we take time, we establish certain learning points and we convince us, we convince people that we need Jesus Christ in our lives. We convince one another that we are, we are sinners in need of repentance. We need a saviour. That is what persuasion is all about. In fact, for us here in the G12 vision, discipleship, uh, discipleship revolves a lot around persuasion. Think about it for a moment. When you meet up, Okay, whether you're a pastor, you're, you're a G12 leader, or you're, you're a cell member even, when you meet up with your own cell members, or when you meet up with your leaders or your pastors, what happens? Let's say you're meeting your, your pastor for dinner. You're going to sit down for two hours. What do you do for those two hours? You just sit down there and for, for two hours. Or do you just sit down there and for non-stop two hours, all you do is recite scripture? No, right? When we meet our leaders, when we meet our members, what do we sit down? We counsel each other. We talk to each other. We don't just vomit scripture nonstop. We don't just keep praying nonstop. We spend time discussing topics. We discuss scripture. We discuss theology. We talk about how we must live our lives as children, as parents, as leaders, as Christians, so on and so forth. We spend time convincing and reasoning with one another that we need to be serving the Lord, that if we're living in sin, we need to come in and, and repent and change our lives. Do you guys follow what I'm saying? That we're not just here to just recite Scripture over and over and over again. We're not just here to just come and sing songs over and over again. Much of our time is spent in persuasion. That is what it's talking about here. In reaching out, Paul uses both preaching and persuasion. He goes up and he preaches the Word of God. He, he takes out the Scripture and he starts saying, this is what the Scripture says. He preaches, he preaches, he preaches. He also goes up to people and he talks about theology with them. He persuades with them. You know what's, why, why it's so important for Paul to persuade people? If you notice Paul, he goes to the synagogues and he needs to persuade the Jewish people to see that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Because as you know, the Jews still wait for the Messiah to come. They do not see that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. And so he's there to persuade, help them to understand that this is the truth. And you see, ultimately, just now, as we look back at, at what Paul says, what does Paul say? Paul says, I don't, I don't rely on the words I use. I rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 19, we see a clear case 
of how Paul teaches, how he persuades, and how he relies on the Holy Spirit all at the same time. Look at Acts chapter 19, verses 2 to 6. This is when he starts his third missionary journey. He goes to a group of believers and he says this, Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? They replied, the baptism of John. And Paul said, John's baptism called for the repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and they prophesied. What happened here? As Paul comes and interacts with them first, what does he do? He persuades them. He's, he's going to talk about them. He's telling them, hey guys, being baptized in John's baptism is not enough. That is incomplete. You need to be baptized in the baptism of Jesus Christ. You need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. And how does he end off? He doesn't just leave it as that, you know. He doesn't just go there and persuade them and say, this is what you need and then he, that's it, I'm done. No, he proceeds to lay his hands on them. And what happens? They receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That didn't come from his words, you know. That didn't come from his persuasive words. That didn't come by what he said. It came because he relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. You guys understand what I'm saying? This is how Paul operates. And if you look, that's how he keeps operating. In Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, let's look at verses 8 to 10. And he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, meaning Christianity, before the multitudes, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years. For two years, he took all the disciples aside. And what did he do? He spent time reasoning, persuading, preaching to them. He spent time reaching out. Let's just look at Paul's life here. Look at how committed he is to reaching out. How committed he is to reaching out to people through his preaching, through his persuasion. He is using his life to be a voice. He will not remain silent. He, will meet, he makes sure that he is used by God to bring about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul often had to do a lot of persuading. Like I said, he had to teach the Jews, he had to help them see that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. And this is something very standard that he does in all his missionary journeys. Wherever Paul went, he would always stay in the Jewish quarters of the city and he would always go to the synagogue and spend time teaching there and preaching there and persuading the people, discussing theology, discussing scripture and very often the same thing happens. He gets kicked out of that place. And here, you know, uh, um, we see how he is known for this. Paul is known for his preaching and for his discussions and for what he does. And that's why in Acts chapter 19, the interesting part about, about how these uh, uh, exorcists try and use, uh, try and just follow what Paul does. And this thing, it says, in Acts chapter 19, verse 13, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. But before I talk about this exorcist, look, it's so interesting. They say, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. You see, Paul is known for his preaching. Paul is known because if, if you ask these people, is Paul's life silent? No, they will say this, Paul's life speaks volumes of what he believes in. Because wherever he goes, he is reaching out to people. He is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is persuading the Jews to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He continually reached out because he knew that people need to receive the saving grace of Jesus. But what about us? Are we, he, all of us here, are we living lives that scream out that Jesus Christ is Lord? Or are we living lives that are completely silent? The truth is this, that there are many of us here that our lives are completely silent. But today we need to ask that same question that Charles Spurgeon did. If all of creation can declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, can I then continue to remain silent? 
Can our lives continue to speak nothing of who Jesus Christ is? Can our lives continue to say nothing of who Jesus Christ is? If that's the case, I'm sorry to say this, we cannot say that we are children of God. We cannot say that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. If you look through Scripture, even nature does it. Even the stones, even the earth does it. You know, and if our lives are silent, we're not even like the stones of the earth. We're not even like the dirt of the earth. We're not even like the creatures of the earth. Because even all of nature, all of creation is able to declare that God is almighty. You see, the thing is this. Often we remain silent because it's easier to remain silent. It's easier for us to keep quiet. It's easier for us to say nothing. Because the fact is, when we choose not to be silent, when we choose our lives to be that voice, to represent, to declare who Jesus Christ is, the truth is this, there will be opposition and there will be difficulties. Did not Paul face a lot of opposition and difficulties? Think about it for a moment. By this time in Acts chapter 18, Paul had already been stoned to death once and he got, he got saved by the Lord Jesus. And that wasn't bad enough. He, even after that, he kept facing all kinds of difficulties. In Acts chapter 18, verse 6 here, it says, when they opposed Paul and became abusive, that's when Paul shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Here at the start of Acts 18, he was speaking in the synagogue. And the people, what did they do? They opposed Paul and they became abusive. Well, of this abusive here, it may not necessarily mean that they got physically abusive with him, but at least they were verbally abusive because in the other translation, they say that they were blasphemed against, uh, against God and against Paul as well. But we need to be mindful for a moment that this verse here, Acts chapter 18, verse 6, it's a very significant verse. It's a very weighty verse. Do you know why? Because there's one thing we tend to forget about the Apostle Paul. Well, to this, so some of us, this may be news. To some of us who study the life of Paul, we will know this a little bit better. As we know, Paul is very well known for his ministry among the Greeks and among the Gentiles. Because he's the one who says that says, salvation is not just for the Jews, or rather it's to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. So he brought this message of salvation to the Gentiles as well. But the one thing we tend to forget is this. We talk so much about his ministry to the Gentiles, we forget that Paul, first and foremost, is also a Jew. He, first and foremost, is a Jew. And when you read Acts chapter 18, verse 6, you know what's happening there? It is basically Paul's own people rejecting him. Paul was persuading the Jews, but the Jews rejected him, they opposed him, they became abusive of him. You go back a couple of chapters when he got stoned to death, who stoned, who stoned Paul to death? The Jews, his own people. You know, honestly, guys, we can't even begin to understand and imagine the amount of rejection that Paul had to go through, and how much rejection he had to endure. And you know, it doesn't just end there, you know, in Acts chapter 18. You move on later, after he departs the synagogue, the Jews continue to fight against him in verses 12 to 13. While Gallio was pro council or the governor of this place called Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack. The Jews got together, made a united attack on Paul, one of their own, and brought him to the place of judgment. They said to the Roman governor, this man they charge is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. A, here it is, you know, his own people got together and united themselves against Paul, you know. It's like your own family. Everyone gets together. Your father, your mother, your sisters, your siblings, your extended uh, family, your cousins, your uncle, auntie, all gather together to form a united front against you. How do you think that rejection feels like? It is a terrible thing. And what they were doing is this. They were tr- basically trying to get Paul in prison. Now, basically, under the Roman Empire, it was illegal for you to worship any other gods except the, the Roman uh, gods or the Greek gods. Or, in some cases, they will, they will worship their rulers like de- deities. So they can only worship these two groups. The only people that have an exemption were the Jews. The Jews were allowed to continue worshipping God. 
And so what the Jews here were doing were basically this. They were trying to convince the Roman authorities that Paul it does not represent them, that Paul is not one of them, that Paul is not, what he's teaching is not Judaism. So he's trying to get them in trouble and if they are convicted, what will happen to Paul and all the believers? They will be captured, they will be imprisoned, probably for the rest of their lives, they will be tortured and they will be beaten. That was the fate that the Jewish people wanted for Paul and those who follow after Paul and follow after Jesus. That's what they wanted for them. That is rejection, my friends. But of course, what happens? Does the Bible not say all, all things work to the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes? Because in the end, Gallio, this, this governor of Achaia, he hears the case, he throws the case out. He says, I don't want to listen to it because as far as he's concerned, Paul is a Jew whatever they believe, he, the, this governor basically saw that Christianity is a sect under Judaism. So he said, this is an internal thing, you go and settle it yourself and I'm not going to do anything. And so Paul and his people, they were all let off. Nothing happened to them. And then later on, in Acts chapter 19, you talk, we're talking about rejection, we're talking about opposition, right? In Acts chapter 19, when Paul arrives in the city of Ephesus, what happens in Ephesus? In Ephesus, the people were up in arms. There was a riot okay? There was a riot. Why? Because of Paul. You look at Acts chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. About that time, there arose a great commotion about Christianity, about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana. Diana was the, the Roman goddess, the Roman goddess Diana. The Greek goddess equivalent would be Artemis, all right? So the, the, he made silver shrines of Diana and it brought no small profit to the craftsmen there. And so he called them together with the workers of similar occupation and he said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by making these shrines. Moreover, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus but throughout almost all of Asia, this guy Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. What was, what was he doing here? This guy, Demetrius, he's a silversmith. How does he make his earnings? He makes silver shrines of the goddess Diana. And he gathered all the different, the different craftsmen who did this as well. And he said, guys, we have been living good lives. We have made enough money for our lives. In fact, we have made a fortune in our lives because of what we do. But now this Paul guy is going around. What is Paul doing? Paul is reaching out. He is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is persuading people to believe that Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. And what's happening? Sales for our, our shrines are going down. No one is buying these idols anymore. And so they're upset because they're, they're not making a livelihood. And Demetrius says one thing that sparks off a riot. He says this, you know what, now not only do we not make money, but this is disrepute to the temple of the goddess Diana, whom everyone worships. And so what happens in verses 28 to 29? When the people heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis, or great is Diana, depends, I mean Roman or, or, or Greek uh, name. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon, the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theatre together. Basically, they got an entire mob, they rushed into this theatre, there were probably thousands of people there, and there was a riot going on for over two hours. They were so angry at Paul and his disciples. You know what they did? For two hours, they stood there and they chanted to, in front of them, great is Artemis, great is Artemis, great is They kept chanting that over and over again. That riot lasted for over two hours and it was so dangerous. Paul, want, Paul interestingly, was not captured and Paul wanted to go into that theatre to go and do something, to go and help his friends but everyone else told Paul not to go in. People who knew Paul said, don't go in for your own safety they would have probably been killed until finally a local official went there and dismissed the crowd. This local official said, all of you are, in, are at risk of being arrested for this illegal gathering. And so finally, they all dismissed. And that brings us to Acts 20, which we'll go through next week. But here's an important question. Regardless of all that has happened, 
regardless of Paul having been stoned to death, being rejected by his own people, by people uniting together to try and put him in prison, by people who just had a riot, seized his own disciples and wanted to kill them, why did Paul carry on? Paul carried on because of what happened in Acts chapter 18, verses 9 to 10. The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Paul kept going on. He carried on because he was commissioned by God. He was commissioned by God to not stay silent. He was commissioned by God that he must live a life that speaks volumes of who Jesus Christ is. And no matter how hard things got, Paul always had God's assurance. He knew that he had all he needed. All he needed was God. And that's why God says, I am with you. Paul showed us what it means to reach out through preaching, through persuasion, regardless of how difficult things got. Jesus did that as well. Jesus demonstrated it to us. Was not Jesus rejected as well? But he still, he still went on and did what he had to do. He, did he not struggle as well? He did. But he still kept going on. You see, church, for many of us here, we know. I mean, anyone, is there, I don't really think that anyone here will come and have a dispute with me that no, we're not called to reach out. We're not called to preach. We're not called to persuade. I don't think anyone will come and, and disagree with me in that. But many people will say this, but pastor, we've tried. We've been rejected, we've been hurt, we've been tired. And you know what? That's true. That happens. And I'm not belittling that. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus understands. Of all people, Jesus will understand the best. He understands. He gets it. He gets it that sometimes we struggle. We have those fearful moments. Hey, Jesus had his moment in the Garden of Gethsemane as well, where he sweat blood because of what was to happen to him. He gets it too that sometimes we're tired. Jesus understands what agony and what it means to be weary, you know. When He hung on the cross, not for two minutes, not for a short while, but He hung there and He died a slow death. And He's saying this to us, guys, hang in there. That rejection, whatever it is you're facing, that defeat, that is not final. See, truth be told, some of us were not willing to pay the price to reach out. We're not willing to do all these things. You know why? Because of this. Instead of focusing on reaching out, we're caught up with what we're reeling in. Instead of focusing on reaching out, we're caught up with what we're reeling in. What is it, what I mean by reeling in? This is this, this, this is like fishing. You go out there, you cast your line, and you reel something in. And many people were so caught up with what we are, what we can get out of life. We're not, we're not focused on reaching outwards. We're focused on something inwards. We're looking at what we can get. We want to do something. We want to receive blessings. We want, to, we want to have good things happen to us. And you know what? Because we just focus on that, we keep looking at that, we will never be willing to reach out because that's a self-centered mentality. Church, listen to this. The fact is this. Reaching out requires sacrifice. Reaching out requires sacrifice. And when we're just caught up with what we can get, what we can reel in, we're going to refuse to reach out. Because we just want blessings. We just want the good things. We don't want the difficulties of life. We don't want the tough things that come in our way. Then you know what? We need to change. I want to quote to you a great man of the Bible, Job. What does Job say? He says this, Shall we accept the good but not the bad? Shall we accept the good but not the bad? Of course not. We need to choose today that whatever happens, we are going to live a life committed to reaching out through our preaching and persuasion. We're going to allow our lives to speak volumes. I know many of us say, yes, I want to reach out. I want to be used by God. But the moment something happens, we stop doing it. And let me ask you something. When you stop doing it, what are you actually saying? You know, when we stop reaching out, it speaks volumes of what we believe. It speaks volumes of what we are doing with our lives. And so today, what should our voice be used for? Number one, it needs to be used for reaching out. Reaching out through preaching 
and persuasion. But it's not enough. That's just one aspect. And in fact, sometimes maybe some of us, we struggle with reaching out through preaching and persuasion because we don't have the second thing. We don't do the second thing. What is the second thing that we must have? What must we do with our voices? What must we do with our lives? Number two, we need to be reaching up. Reaching up through our prayer and praise. We need to reach up through our prayer and praise. Finally, we must acknowledge, you know, that Paul could do all that he did. He could endure all that he did because he always reached up to God through prayer and praise. In fact, I want to say this, it's because he always reached up in prayer and praise, that's why he would be willing to endure whatever he did. Both are important. And it, how does he do that? He does it through a lifestyle of prayer and praise, a lifestyle of dedication, a lifestyle of reaching upwards, a lifestyle of being connected to God no matter the situation. And you know, there's something not explicitly mentioned in Acts chapter 18 and 19, but we can see how he is receiving the effects of being connected to the Lord. In Acts chapter 18, verse 5, it says this, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was what? Compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. You know, I'll tell you something. The only way we can be compelled by the Spirit is when we are connected to the Spirit, is when we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And we cannot be connected to the Holy Spirit if we don't make it a point to reach upwards through our prayer and our praise. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 tells us this, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. We need to follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And you know what? Paul was always following the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Know that? Well, he's always focusing upwards. Well, one thing I want to share with us is that as you look through Scripture, go and look through the epistles or any letter that, that is written by the Apostle Paul to the churches. What is one common thing at the start of these letters? Very commonly at the start of these letters, you see how Paul writes a thanksgiving to the Lord. He praises the Lord. He thanks the Lord for what is going on. Why? Because he's reaching upwards. Whatever happens, he's looking up towards God. And you know, there's something very important, you know. Our praise and thanksgiving. Uh, you know, honestly, this is some, I, I know we all understand, yeah, prayer is something very important. I think we don't actually believe or we don't understand the importance of prayer and thanksgiving. I'll tell you something that I observe in church, which I honestly find is a very weird thing. Whenever we gather together as a cell group or as leaders in a meeting or a congregational meeting or a team meeting, how come it takes forever for someone to share a thanksgiving? As a pastor, when I come out and say, hey, is there anyone who wants to share a thanksgiving? It's like I'm trying to squeeze blood from stone, you know. It's like, hey, any thanksgiving? And those who come to our leaders' meeting, okay, there's an SP, we all know SP will say this, it's okay, I'll wait. And you sit on the stage, you sit on the step. And it's like, honestly, guys, should we not live a life where at any time, hey, I'm ready with thanksgiving. I'm, I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done. And then we go and give thanks. You know, there may be many reasons why we don't give thanks. Some of us, of course, were, were, were shy to come on stage. Oh, that's one thing, but you know, I encourage you, just go and, just go and, and, and take the step of faith. But there's some people, right, I've met, and say, I cannot think of what to thank God for this week. I'm like, are you sure? If we are like that, you know why? It's because we've not been reaching up. We've not been focusing on God. We're so caught up with what we do, our own thing, we don't see how God has moved in our lives. That's why I always, I, I've talked to us about the hymn many times, that hymn, Count Your Blessings. It keeps telling us that in this hymn, it says, count your blessings, name them one by one. So you never forget. And it says, as you count your blessings, and you name them one by one, it will surprise you when you see what the Lord has done. The thing is, many of us, we, we never focus on, we're not, we're not reaching upwards to God. We're doing our own thing. Praise and thanksgiving. I want to challenge you, you know, guys, when your cell leader asks, can I get a thanksgiving? It should be, oh, me, 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 I want to share, I want to share. It should, you know, it should not be that the pastor has to try and 
we, as a pastor, we should not be goading people to come and share thanksgiving, no. We should be stopping people from giving thanks because there are too many of us trying to give thanks. That's how it should be, what? Anyone, anyone want to give thanks? Well, everybody want to give thanks. Hey, guys, you know, we all cannot give thanks today because they let me have cell group ready. So maybe just two of you. Oh, okay, then we all give thanks. Now it's like, come, let's give thanks. Come on, just three. Just three people. Two? One? Then at the end, what happens? The cell leader. Okay, la, I share, la, I share. <laughs> right? Okay? That's how it happens. you laugh because it's true. That's what happens in the cell group. But guys, we need to be reaching up. We need to be constantly connected with the Lord. We need to be praising God. We need to be thanking the Lord in all that we do. And as you look at, the, at Apostle Paul's life, he was always connected to the Lord. He was always reaching up. He was dedicated. He was devoted to the Lord in thanksgiving and in praise and also in prayer. And he always walked close to the Lord. I want to show you something that happens in Acts chapter 18 that shows us how close he walks to the Lord. Acts chapter 18, verse 18. It says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sancria, for he had taken a vow. That's a simple verse. Now, what I want to point out to us is that he had taken a vow. Now, what is this vow here that Paul had taken? This vow here is called the Nazarite vow. It's called the Nazarite vow. And where you can find more, of, more about this is in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. I'm not going to be looking at all of it, but Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Basically, this vow is a time, is, is something that happens within a fixed time where they choose to fast. They fast from, from wine, they fast from certain food, they fast from doing things that are ceremony, unclean, whatever. Why do they do that? Look at Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. It says this, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites, say to them, If a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite. The vow of, the Nazarite vow is a vow of dedication. In other, in other translations of the Bible, it says that it's a vow of separation. Not separation from God, but separation from the world. And so this is Paul's walk of the Lord. That here he was making this Nazarite vow. And there are many reasons why Paul could have been doing this Nazarite vow. I'm not here to talk about that. But I'm here to talk about something interesting, the nature of Paul's work. Think about this, you know. Would we really expect Paul to be on this vow? Do we actually think that Paul needs to be on this vow? Honestly, you ask me, right? I think no need, you know. I would, I would say Paul is someone who doesn't need a vow to show how committed he is to the Lord. I mean, think about this, you know. The man was practically preaching and persuading people in synagogues on a daily basis. Not just, not just on Sundays, but every single day he's in the church. He's discipling people. He's discussing theology. He's talking to them about scriptures. And if he's not doing that in the synagogues to the Jewish people or to the, the, the Greeks or the Gentiles, he's doing that among the disciples. And basically, every moment of his life is about doing God's work. But I want to, I want to teach you something very important. Paul was so immersed and soaked in God's work, God's temple, and God's people, but yet he knew all those can never substitute God's presence. Paul was so immersed. Every single moment of his life, he was doing God's work. Every single day, he was in God's temple. Every single day, he was surrounded and he was discipling God's people. But you know what? You can be doing God's work. You can be sitting in God's temple. You can be surrounded by God's people. But all those cannot, cannot replace the presence of God. God's people, God's temple, God's work is not God's presence. Are those important things? Of course they're important. But they are not God's presence. We need to be just like Paul. What did Paul do? Basically, I want to summarize in this. In order to reach out effectively, we need to reach up regularly. In order to reach out effectively, we need to reach up regularly. And today I want to ask us, you know, have we been reaching up regularly? Have we been reaching up? Have we been praying have we been thanking the Lord and praising the Lord in all that we do? Have we been seeking the Lord? Have we been walking closely to the Lord? You know, if some of us have not, maybe, you know what? It's time for us to, well, take some kind of vow like that. Go on a fast. You know, in every year, we have, we have 
we have a moment that we can all come and fast together. You know, every year, Love Singapore Churches, we come together, we have 40 days of fasting. Last year, we have the Jubilee Day, we have 50 days of fasting. But why do we do a fast? Or why do, why do people like Paul go on a, on a vow like that? The purpose of a fast is this, it causes us to be more focused on being dependent on God rather than being dependent on the world. And today, there's some of us here, you feel like you're far from the Lord. I'll tell you, maybe you just go on a fast. It's time for you to go on a fast. It's time for you to start praying every day. It's time for you to start praising and thanking the Lord wherever you have the opportunity. Even if people don't ask you to share thanksgiving, you will share thanksgiving. To who? I don't know. Share to yourself. Whatever it is, you're just so filled up with prayer and with praise and with thanksgiving. We need to do that. And I'll tell you this, when you do that, whatever ministry you're in will be effective. Sometimes we're not effective in reaching out in our cell groups. We're not effective in sharing the gospel. I mean, sometimes we feel like we're not effective in teaching the word of God. We're not effecting, effective in leading worship or whatever. Let me tell you this, it all comes down to this. Maybe it's because we're not reaching up regularly. I don't care if you're a musician, you're in the chorale. I don't care if you're, you're an usher or you're a preacher here or you're a teacher at our SOL classes. All of us, you will not be effective in what you do if you never reach up regularly. You, ne- you are never connected to God. You know how, how effective was Paul? Paul was so connected to God that I'm not sure how effective he was. It says this in Acts chapter 19, verses 11 to 12 in the New King James Version. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. And in the in the NIV version, it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched them were taken to those who were ill Illnesses were cured, evil spirits left them. You know, as I look at this verse here, you know what really gets me, you know? What really gets me is this part where it says, unusual or extraordinary miracles. Let me ask you something. Isn't a miracle by definition something unusual and extraordinary already? A miracle already is extraordinary. It's already unusual. So what does it mean here? What does it mean when it says that these are extraordinary miracles, these are unusual miracles? It means that these are extra, extraordinary miracles. These are unusually unusual miracles. Even for, by miracle standards, these are unusual. And it's quite unusual. Over here, you read about him. Even when all Paul needs to do, if Paul anoints a cloth, a handkerchief, and he's brought to someone who's sick, they are healed even through that. Now, as I look at this, it talks about this, you know, talk about this unusual miracles. Um, what do we understand here? Well, number one, I can infer this. If there are unusual miracles, it means that there are also usual miracles. And in Paul's ministry, there are many usual miracles. Miracles are a dime a dozen. Miracles are a common occurrence in his ministry. Second thing is this that through the, the miracles that Paul uh, uh, performs under the Holy Spirit, in a sense, these are more miraculous or they're more significant, they're better to a certain extent. I mean, honestly, let's think about it for a moment. Most of us here, we don't even live lives where regular miracles happen wherever we go. And here it is, that wherever Paul goes, extraordinary, even more special, specialer, Miracles happen wherever he goes. Unusual miracles happen wherever he goes. Why? Because he is so in tune with the Lord. He's so in tune with the Holy Spirit because he continually reaches up. He's so devoted. Even as a successful person in ministry, he doesn't need to take the Nazarite vow. He still chose to do that because he wants to be even more, no matter what, he says, I want to be even more dedicated and more devoted to God. A man who spends every single day in a synagogue, every single day discipling people, this man says, I need to be more committed to God. Some of us here in church really, well, I, I go, go G12, one up, one down, or I go church service, or three times a week, well, I'm very dedicated already. This guy, seven days a week, I'm not dedicated enough. I need to be more committed. That is what, that is his attitude. And when he has an attitude, he's so in tune with the Lord, he's so familiar with the presence of God. I'll tell you something, miracles, while miracles come from God, you will note this, you know, 
then miracles tend to happen more frequently around people who walk closely with the Lord. Miracles come from the Lord, but they tend to happen more frequently around people who walk closely to the Lord. You see, in the end, if you're not familiar with the presence of God, you're not familiar with the Holy Spirit, then you're not going to know how to move in the supernatural when He leads us into it. Just remember, these miracles come from God. They don't come from us. If it comes from us, right, then it doesn't matter whether I'm connected to God or not. I just go and do whatever I do. Be healed, be healed, and then you're healed already. But it doesn't work that way. How it works is that the Holy Spirit leads us. Remember Galatians 5.25? The leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us. And very often, when we minister as a pastor, when I minister, when I pray for healing, it's like that. The Lord tells me, pray for this area of healing. And then I go and do it. And I follow that prompting. That's how it works. It's not that I want you to be healed, therefore you will be healed. It's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with us. It's all to do with God. Or rather, the part that it has to do with us is whether we walk closely with the Lord and we're sensitive to Him. I know I always teach this to, to the worship ministry, especially to the worship leaders. I say this, you know, that we're up here on the platform. How effective we are leading worship, is de it depends on how closely we walk to the Lord. It's how familiar we are with the presence of the Lord. You know what? There have been a few examples. In, in my own life, it's happened to me as a worship leader when I was, when I was starting out. And even now, I, I do give debrief like this to some of our worship teams as well. Because I remember when I was starting out, there were moments after the worship, after I led worship, my dad came up to me. He said, Daniel, do you know that at that point when you're singing this song, there was a very strong anointing of the Lord. And that the Lord's presence was very, was, was, the, the heavens were ready to be opened and, and, and heaven will come down on earth right there. And you know what I said? Oh, is it? I had no idea. And I find myself having the same thing for sometimes when I talk to some worship leader, I say, you know, at this point, the Holy Spirit was so strong. You know, down there, what miracles will happen right there and then because suddenly it feels like a thickness in the air. The Holy Spirit was just so thick there. And then they say, oh, is it? I didn't know. You see, when we're not, I'm not, I'm not belittling anyone. We all have that journey to go through. But when we're not sensitive to how the Spirit is moving, we will miss out on many of these moments. I want to submit to you, you know, many times that when Paul was walking around ministering to people, the Holy Spirit speaking to him, pray for healing over this person, declare this, speak over this area of his life, declare this. And how, does, how, how is Paul able to do that? Because he walks so closely to the Lord. He's so connected to the Lord. Paul was someone who was familiar with God's presence and God's power. He's familiar with the Holy Spirit. Whatever happened, he would always acknowledge God and turn his eyes towards God. And that was something very important to Paul. It's so important to Paul. Because with what Paul was doing, he had to only rely on, on God's strength. When you pray for a healing, you know it's not, you, you can only like, oh, oh God, please work. You know it's not about us anymore. And you see how, you see how effective Paul is in his ministry. You talk about unusual miracles following him, right? Well, another unusual thing happens in Acts chapter 19, which I think is, has got to be one of the funniest things ever in the Bible. I think it's my, one of my favourite passages. It's the part where it talks about the seven sons of Sceva, or Seva, um, these seven Jewish exorcists, all right? And it says this in, in, in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 16. It says, Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who are evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of, of, of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was in leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Jesus I know. Paul I also know. Who are you? Who on earth are you? I find this hilarious because their understanding of moving the power of God is totally superficial. They don't understand what made Paul effective in what he did. Listen to this church. Paul was effective not because he knew a name, but because he personally knew the one he named. Paul was effective not because he knew a name, but because he personally knew the one that he was naming. You know, I, I, I always remember that 
this, I was reading this book, the pastor, he mentioned this, you know, he, he likens this, this account to this. He says this, you know, uh, let me just paraphrase it into our own context. Imagine this, you know, imagine the Singapore ambassador to the United Kingdom walks into an official meeting with all the officials there and he goes up to them and he says this, on behalf of the President of Singapore, I want to make this request. This is this, this. Now, these government officials in the United Kingdom, do you think they would take this man seriously? Of course they would. He's the ambassador of, from Singapore to the United Kingdom. He's appointed by the President of Singapore. And so they'll take him seriously. And they will listen, or at least listen to what he has to say. Now, let's paint a different scenario. Imagine in a in a couple of weeks' time, in a couple of months' time, I'm going to be in, in London ministering there as well. Imagine I go up to a government building there. I go into this official meeting. I go to all these, United, uh, these British officials. And I say this, on behalf of the President of Singapore, I want to make the following demands. And I start listing out my demands. What do you think the people are going to say? Singapore, I know. The President of Singapore, I also know. But who are you? Who am I to make such a demand? I have no place to make such a demand just because I can use that name, just because I can use that, that authority, so to speak, doesn't mean I'll be effective in it. Why? Because in the end, I'm not, I've not been appointed by the President of Singapore. It happens the same thing with these seven sons of Seva. They were not appointed by the Lord. They can use His name, but it doesn't matter. And I just think it's so funny. I can just imagine how it, how it went. These, these, these guys, these exorcists, they go to the Spirit, say, in the name of Jesus, that Paul preaches about, get out. And then the Spirit's like, who, who are you guys? He looks at God. Hey, God, are these your guys? And then God's like, I don't know. Oh, okay, thanks. And he goes and beats them up. That is something that we all need to understand. What's the difference between Paul and these guys? Paul had a personal walk with the Lord that made him effective. They failed not because the enemy was too strong, you know. They failed because they did not know God. I'll tell you this, for many of us here in the ministry, we're the same thing, you know. We use, we, we know when to use the name of Jesus. We know when to pray. We know how to speak Christian, Christianese. We know how to use our language. We know how to sound holy. Basically, it's this. We know what to do, but we don't know the one we're doing it for. Just now I said, if we want to be effective in reaching out, we've got to be effective, in re- we've got to be regular in reaching up. Some of us, I hear this, we're no different from these sons of Seva. You know why? We know what to say. We know what to do. And we're even doing these things. But we face defeat and defeat and defeat over and over again, not because the enemy is too strong, but because we've not been reaching up, because we do not have a personal walk with God. We know what to do, but we don't know the one we're doing it for. We have not desired for more of God. St. Augustine writes this, Longing, desire, prayeth always, though the tongue be silent. If thou art longing, thou art ever praying. And so church, today I want to tell us this. We need to be reaching up regularly through our prayer and praise. Today, as I share this, I want to tell us this, that our lives are voices. And if our lives are voices, what should these, our voices be used for? Well, number one, it must be used for reaching out. It must be used to reach out through our preaching and our persuasion. And number two, we need to reach up through our prayer and praise. And today I want to ask, as you end off, I want to ask us this very important question. What does my life say about my conviction? What does my life say about my conviction? The truth is, the way we live our life will speak volume of our spiritual walk. If we've not been seeking the Lord, if we've not been reaching out to people around us, if we've not been willing to submit to our leaders, if we've not been faithful and so on and so forth, then our life is screaming something else. It's not screaming that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as some of us here, we're just completely silent. We're either giving up or we've given up. Today, the Lord says, hang in there. Keep going. And if you're totally, completely silent, today, use your voice to speak. 
your life can speak far louder than you think it can. And so I want to encourage you, never stay silent. Make it a point to reach up. Make it a point to reach out. Don't be stingy with your voice. Preach and pray. Praise the Lord at every opportunity. You know, I know I've actually got so many testimonies on the share. Now I've got to cut them even shorter because we're running out of time. But yesterday, I already had a lot of testimonies that I cut short and now I've got to cut them even shorter. But I just want to tell you what happens when we don't stay silent, when we refuse to stay silent. When you choose to let your life be a voice that declares that Jesus Christ is Lord, you know what? The people around you are going to hear that and their lives are going to be touched. Their lives are going to be changed. I want to share with you a couple of testimonies just very quickly first about these testimonies that we heard from a, a TV station in Russia. This TV station is Trinity Broadcasting Network, their Russian branch. And we got four testimonies that were sent in to us through their, their, their website. There's one testimony that comes from St. Petersburg. And this man writes, that several months ago, my wife and I could not have imagined that we would be alive right now. We were addicted to drugs, but today, we now have a happy family. We have two sons, we both have good jobs, and we even have a car. We now serve in our church, and our lives have completely turned around. You know how our lives turn around? It turned around because we were once living in my mother's kitchen because we had nowhere else to go. And the TV was on in the house. And it was set to TBN Russia. And a pastor was preaching. And the word he spoke was so powerful, and it spoke to me. It was as if he knew my situation and was speaking directly to me and no one else. And that moment, I felt the presence of God in my life. And immediately, I changed. I stopped taking drugs. We both cleaned up our acts together. And today, we're serving the Lord in our church. There's another testimony from a lady in Russia. She says, you know, we've been praying for a non-believer for three years. And recently, we start to see the fruit. He chose to repent and receive Christ. And he now attends church and youth meetings regularly. So this lady asked him, what changed? He said, I was watching TV and I flipped to TBN Russia and there's this pastor preaching and he preached about God and the Bible as though it was something alive and powerful, not dead like what we have in the Orthodox churches. And I knew I needed what he was talking about and right there and then I received Christ. And this man, he is now praying for the salvation of the people in his office. Another person from Russia, I thank the Lord for you and your prayers. We, we have been a believing family, but, re, but a while ago, my husband left me to be with another woman. He fell into fornication and drug addi addiction. We prayed for several months and God answered. I was watching a sermon on TV in Russia and this sermon showed me through the Bible that even in my difficulties, God still works. And so I worked on myself instead of trying to fix my husband. After that, after I changed, my husband miraculously came back to me, repented and has re returned to the family. We are now coming together as a couple to continue to pray and work through our relationship and God is bringing that restoration. And as the last testimony of this, how this guy shares that he received Christ after watching a pastor preach through this, this, uh, this, this television station. He was searching for things in other religions, but finally when he heard this message, he felt like the pastor was speaking to him as well. And he said, you know what, this is what I need. And right there and then, he was actually diagnosed with a terminal illness. And in his house, he was healed without completing his medication. And he is alive because of that. Do you know what's so unique about these testimonies? These testimonies are so unique because they all heard one pastor who refused to stay silent, who kept on preaching through whatever opportunity there was, whether it's through uh, 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 the, the television or through a pulpit. And you know what? The message that these people heard was from a series called Extreme Discipleship, Normal Christian Living. The pastor that they all heard was our senior pastor, Lawrence Kong. And because he chose to live a life of never staying silent, of preaching the Word of God in season and out of season, lives have been touched, lives have been changed. I'll tell you my own testimony. You know, for, 
for me, I've shared with us many times that somehow the Lord has given me this unique uh, uh, area of ministry to pray for couples that cannot conceive children. And I've shared with us many testimonies of, and many of you have shared with me your testimonies, how I prayed for you, and, and after that, you now have a family. But just remember, I just remember that, I'm not going to share about those testimonies itself, but somehow I just remembered about this because last year, the Lord put upon my heart and He said, wherever you minister, go and pray for couples who cannot conceive. And so I did so when I travelled to Korea to preach, when I travelled to Mongolia to preach. Even last year, uh, Serena and I, we were in, in Australia at a, visiting a church as well. We were asked to pray for people. I prayed for people who cannot conceive children as well. And so out of curiosity, on Friday night, I messaged Esther. Esther is Pastor Lee Sangban's daughter. I asked, Esther, do you have any testimonies in Korea about people who received that healing? And she said, we'll find out. And it happens that this weekend, they're having a leaders' conference there. So they announced at the whole conference, anyone got testimony of, of this? And one of the leaders came up to share. The leader shared, this leader shared this, that this leader, she had been trying to reach out to another friend who was unable to conceive a child. And so this leader, when she was trying to befriend that person, she asked him, hey, how can I pray for you? And that friend said, she desperately wants to have a child in her family. And so when I was at the G12 conference in Korea last year, I released that word, I want to pray for people who cannot conceive children. And so this church leader, she came out on behalf of that friend. She received that prayer, she took authority over the, 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 the illness and she declared that healing was there. And after that conference, she continued to intercede and to pray for this friend. And you know what? This friend, she is now attending Pastor Lee's church regularly. She has received Christ, she's attending the church and as of Friday, she was six months pregnant. Come on, let's just praise the Lord. That's what happens when you, when you walk with God and you hear God leading you and you reach out to people and tell you something, people's lives are going to be blessed. People's lives are going to change. I want to just lastly share, I just, in the end, I share all the testimonies because you can never share too many testimonies. But this one is so important to us because these are two testimonies from, from, from um, my team, Serene and I, my team, about missionaries for a day. You know, we went out missionaries for a day. We went to be a blessing to the people. We went to do street evangelism. And our 12, they share this about their, 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 their members. He said that I'd like to give thanks to God for the amazing MFAD experience we had as a cell. One of my members, it was his first time doing street evangelism. He obeyed God and went out to do it. So he was praying and looking out for people and he saw a young man sitting at a void deck smoking alone. And so God prompted him to approach that young man. And he went up, he shared a blessing, he managed to share John 3.16, but this young man did not receive Christ that day. But our leader, our member, continued to follow up and invited this young man to attend church service. And this young man did. And when he came to the church service, he received Christ during that service. And so our leader continued to follow up with him through weekly meetings and went through the New Life with Jesus uh, a book with him. And my child challenged this leader to start an open cell. Now that you have one fruit, start an open cell with this young man. And so they started that open cell and they're meeting regularly. And this young man, this new convert, he is now, a, he has attended Men's Encounter Weekend. He has decided to be baptised. He is already registered for post-encounter and he is currently reaching out to another friend whom he regularly brings to this new open cell as a visitor. And so my leader says, praise the Lord. Last but not least, he has stopped smoking. Come on, let's just praise the Lord. This is what happens when we avail ourselves to reach out to the people around us. When we walk close to the Lord and we move in the Lord's power, things will happen. This last testimony is this, from that same trial. One of our members was doing MFAD at Serangoon area and approached this elderly lady who works at Next Shopping Mall. This lady was open to receive prayers of blessings and even decided to receive Christ after hearing John 3.16. Since she's working at Next, our member decides, uh, arranged to meet her uh, at the mall itself for a regular catch-up and over time went through the New Life with Jesus book with her in Mandarin. This member doesn't, is not exactly very fluent in, in, in Mandarin. And as, she, as, as this elderly lady needs to work on weekends, she cannot always attend service, our member will continue to print out four W's from the FCBC website and will share the Mandarin four W's with her whenever they meet. And our leader writes, I still remember our member will continue to ask us certain words because uh, uh, she doesn't know how to pronounce those words. 
but you know what? As they start to see fruit in this area, God's blessing didn't just end there. This elderly lady, lady encouraged her son to meet our 12. And they managed to meet up over dinner and as they met and they talked, they shared Christ with him and right there at that dinner, he received Christ. Today, this elderly lady comes to our Hawkins service regularly with one of our, our, our members and she attends the open cell led by that same member. And her son now attends our English services. He's currently attending pre-encounter and is being consolidated into another cell group. I'm going to just praise the Lord. And this is happening all throughout the church. Last week, I tell you, I received so many testimonies from Pastor Wee Long. It's considered spam already, you know. He's seen so many testimonies about all these things happening. But that's what happens when we choose not to stay silent. When we choose to ignore the fears, the struggles that are around us and we say, I'm not going to stay silent. My voice is going to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to every single person around. And we go out and do that. And I shared these different testimonies because we're doing this at every level of the church. My dad, myself, our members, even through MFAD, these things are happening. It just simply starts with a choice to say, my life is not going to be a silent one. If all creation speaks up for God, well, my life is going to be a voice that will always declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And church, today I want to encourage us, we need to continue reaching out. And we need to continue reaching up. And today I just sense this. Today I just want us to, I just want to close with a time of ministry because I know the Lord needs to do a deep ministry. Last night, I just wish we had more time to pray for people. Because today the Lord says that many of us, we need to come back to Him. I'm talking about the Christians here. You need to come and receive that hunger for the Lord. We need to come and allow the Lord to stir up something in our lives. There are honestly some of us here that we've not been effective in our ministry. And we blame everything else except our walk with God. We say, this is too hard, too many things to do, not enough time, too scary, too big, too difficult. But those are not, those, well, those are factors. Those are not the things that will change, you know. Like I said this, you know, when those exorcists tried to cast out that demon, it's not that the demon was too strong for them, you know. It was that they did not have a walk with God. Some of us here, our ministries are not effective because we're not reaching up regularly. There's some of us here, we're not reaching out because we are just, we're just so busy trying to think what we can reel in into our lives. What can, what can I get out of it? You know what? It never works like that. It never works like that. You know, since I use the illustration of reeling something in like a fish, like we go fishing. You know when you go out and fish, you throw that line out and then you, you, you try and fish. You know, you don't always catch fish. Sometimes your hook hooks trash. You get caught in something else. And some of us, you know, you know, it's just garbage that we pick up. The garbage of unforgiveness, the garbage of past hurts and past failures, the garbage of things. Uh, and, and the thing is, we're not willing to let go, you know. We leave that thing hooked and we're still trying to reel that thing in. We're, we're desperately we're fighting it, you know, and we're trying to reel in that garbage into our life. Or some of us, we're holding on to the fish, we're walking away, but the line is still attached to all these things. Unforgiveness, sin is attached to our failures or whatever. And we're walking around and we think we're fine, but we don't see this line that's connected all the way there. Today, the Lord says, all this needs to, we need to get rid of all this. We need to come and change. Some of us were disappointed with the ministry or were feeling tired. Today, the Lord just says this, don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Keep on moving on. Don't be silent. And the reason we don't have to be silent, the reason we don't have to be afraid is because God says, I am here with you. 
And there are probably some of us here who say this, you know, God, what do you mean you're here with me? I don't think you are here with me. We always like to say this, you know, well, I'm going through this kind of thing. We go through things like Pong, well, bad things happen to us. And we say, God, where are you when I need you the most? You know what? I'll tell you something interesting. God is always there. God will never leave us nor forsake us. I thought something very interesting, you know, we sang this song to the Holy Spirit. What, what does the bridge say? Let us become more aware of your presence. Very often the problem is not whether God is there or not. The problem is whether we are aware that whether He's there or not. The Bible, what does the Bible say? Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. In Revelation, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and, and invite me in, I will come in and eat with him and him with me. But the thing is this, sometimes we're so caught up with our own lives, we don't hear that knocking and we don't see that God is there already. Because just remember, God is the first person who reached out to us when He sent His Son, Jesus. What is Jesus' name? His name is Emmanuel. God with us. And even when Jesus ascended back to heaven, did He leave us alone? We were left with someone, the Holy Spirit. So let's not, let's not ever say that, oh, God's not there when I need Him. God has always been there. We've just not been aware. We've just not been looking out. And the reason we're not aware is because we're so filled with other garbage in our life. Our life is totally not, we've not been reaching up to Him that we have no idea that He's there. And today, this must change. You know, church, why don't we just stand up over this place? Let's just stand over here in, in, in TC and over there in, in Suntec City. But this is what I want us to do. I'm going to pray for you in a moment's time and then after that, we're going to come and we're going to worship the Lord. And as we worship the Lord, the altar's open. I want you to come and respond to the Lord because I know there's many of us We've not been reaching out. We've not been effective. Some of you know that our walk is not there. That's why things are not happening. You know what the Lord is speaking to you. Today, you need to come and get right with the Lord. And I ask that today, the Lord will stir up something in you. The Lord will give you that new longing, a new desire. Because church, we need to cry out. If we don't cry out, nothing is going to happen. We're going to see revival is spent. Revival is not found in us going to another conference, it's not found in us doing another program. Revival is found when we get down on our knees and we cry out day and night saying, Lord, we need more of you. Revival is found when we spend every single living moment serving the Lord and in our church, but yet we say, Lord, I need more of you. I need to be more committed to you. That is when revival is going to take place. And today, some of you here, your cell leaders, your cell has been in a slump. It feels like your cell has been in a desert. Today, we want to pray for you. We're going to break that curse in the name of Jesus because the Lord, what does He say? He says He will give us streams of living waters even in the wasteland. And today, if we cry out for that, if we cry out to the Lord with all our hearts, we will find Him. And so I want you to just lift up your hands over this place, over there at TC, at Suntec. I want to pray for you and after this, we're going to start, we're going to worship the Lord and as we worship the Lord, you come and respond. Lord, we just want to thank you for this word today. Lord, we ask that you come and you move among us today. Lord, we want to cry out to you. We say that we need more of you. Lord, teach us what it means to reach out. Help us to reach out effectively by reaching up to you regularly. So Lord, today as we come and we respond, we have a longing for more of you. We want to see more of you among us. We want to be aware of your presence wherever we go. Lord, we want to declare that to, in our church, we are going to see extraordinary miracles. We're going to see unusual miracles because Lord, you are with us. So Lord, today right now, I ask that as we minister, you will tear down the walls, tear down the blockages of our hearts, that we will be aware of you moving with us and we will see the breakthroughs in our in our ministries, we will see the breakthroughs as we continue to walk with you. So Lord, we declare this and as we come and receive ministry, Lord, move among us, tear down walls, break down strongholds. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. We're going to continue worshipping the Lord. As we worship the Lord, if you need to be ministered, you need to respond, you come down and receive that ministry. So let's just worship the Lord. Lift up our hands over this place. If you're still being prayed for, continue to be prayed for. In the name of Jesus, I want to declare this, that your life is a voice 
And then from this day forth, all of us together, our lives will speak volumes of who Jesus is in our lives. That Lord, we want to declare at every moment that You are the Lord of our lives. Lord, today we want to commit ourselves to always reach out and to always reach up to You. And Lord, we know that as we reach up to You regularly, we will be able to reach out effectively. And right now, I want to speak over every single person that feels that you are in a slum whether it's in your ministry or in your life, you feel like you're in that desert, in the name of Jesus right now, I break that curse. I break that curse in the name of Jesus. We declare that the Lord is the one who brings streams of living waters into the desert. That the Lord is the one who makes the path in the wilderness. And so I speak that over you right now. Receive a fresh outpouring of the breath of life that comes from God. We declare this in over every area of your life that you're going to see those fruits. You're going to see that fruit fruit that lasts because just sense the Lord saying we're entering into a new season so I declare this over you right now over anyone who has a spirit of rejection a spirit of fear a spirit of timidity a spirit of unforgiveness I break it right now in the name of Jesus because you have no place in our lives we declare that all darkness has to flee in the mighty name of Jesus and so Lord we want to declare that from this day forth Lord we're going to see a revival here in our church. Lord, we're going to see heaven coming down in this place as we seek you with all our hearts, with all our strength, and with all our might. So Lord, we thank you. We pray all this in your most mighty name. Amen, amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God bless you. You're dismissed. Tell some beside you, revival is here. And if you're still receiving ministry, continue to receive ministry. And God bless you. We'll see you next week.